What I want to introduce you to in this video uh, is something called a reversible reaction and how that reaction can reach chemical equilibrium. We mentioned equilibrium with solutions and talked about how equilibrium there meant that dissolving and recrystallizing were happening at equal rates and canceling each other out so you wouldn't actually see a net change. In chemical equilibrium it's similar except instead of dissolving and recrystallizing we have a reaction proceeding in one direction and a reaction happening in the opposite direction at the same time. And for the first time we'll look at reactions then that are reversible and can happen both ways. Typically up till now we've looked at reactions that have uh, what we would call a one-way arrow. Reversible reactions have a two-way arrow. Okay? Typically up to this point we look at something called an end reaction where the arrow points from left to right because reactants are turning into products. And these reactions are called end reactions because they have a natural ending point. They end when either A or B or perhaps both reactants run out or completely used up. When that happens, the reaction has to stop. That limiting reactant runs out and the reaction ends. And so an end reaction has a true stopping point. When one of those things is, is used up, the reaction's over and that's the end of it until we find some more. We show these with a left to right one way arrow and this is kind of what we're used to doing at this point and haven't done much with anything else. What we're going to start looking at though is reactions where reactants are converted to products but then products can actually turn right back around and, and react in the opposite direction to make the reactants all over again. And that makes things a little bit more complicated. These are called reversible reactions. A reversible reaction can proceed both forward and reverse. And so you see here between the reactants and products there's a two-way arrow showing that the A, A and B can give us C and D and then the products C and D can become reactants in the reverse reaction and reproduce A and B. So the reaction can kind of go both ways. When we start looking at reactions like this we need a way to kind of gauge which way the reaction is favoring. Is the reaction going forward from A to B turning into C and D or are C and D more effective at turning back into A and B? And in the end, this reaction never truly ends because A and B start getting used up in the reaction, but C and D are always kind of replacing even just a little bit of them. And so even though it might seem like A and B have been completely used up, they never really are. We call this reaction equilibrium when the forward reaction rate is equal to the reverse reaction rate. They're canceling each other out. You wouldn't see any net change if you were measuring the amount of C and D or A or B present if you're, if you're measuring that over the course of several minutes or hours, you might not see any change at all overall because as soon as A and B make product, then those products turn back into reactants and the reaction's canceling itself out. At that point again, there's no net change in the concentrations or the amounts for each reactant and product, but both the forward and the reverse reaction will continue at equal rates. I had a job in college working at a, at a, ma a manufacturing f factory uh, out in Fargo and one of the things that I, I always kind of imagine as a story for this is if you were to go looking for a part-time job and you went to a factory where they would pay you really good money for sitting around and screwing nuts onto bolts all day long just screw them on there put them together and put them in this bucket screw one on there and put it in this bucket well, if you can imagine having a job like that would be very tedious but if you got paid well hey what the heck right so they start putting these nuts and bolts together and putting it in a bucket. You're sitting there doing them one at a time. Meanwhile, someone, someone comes in from their lunch break, sits down across from you, and starts taking apart the nuts and bolts that you've been putting together and puts them back in their own separate buckets. Well, that may drive you crazy at first, but as long as you're getting paid, I suppose it's not so bad. But if you can imagine that if you are faster at putting them together and the person across from you is somewhat slower, over time we would see you kind of winning or we would see the reaction favoring you as you're turning these two pieces into one screwed together piece at the end. And your partner taking them apart isn't as fast, so overall you'd start to get ahead. You'd start making more product, more product, more product, and your partner couldn't keep up with you going in the opposite direction. When we look at reaction equilibrium, when we look at um, reversible reactions, it's kind of the idea of how can we make sure that we're always going forward? How can we make sure that A and B are turning into C and D more effectively than the opposite would be true. Now the way that we measure who's winning, we can't go in and count bolts or nuts in a bucket. But what we can do is, is more or less sort of count the concentration. How many moles of A, B, C, and D are present in the, in the reaction system when it's at equilibrium. So we can make measurements. We can, 
we can measure directly or sometimes indirectly the concentrations of most reactants and products. And we measure them in terms of their molarity. So we measure the changes in molarity. If my molarity is going up with time, that means that I'm being made and I'm probably not being used up in reverse. Uh, if my molarity is decreasing with time, that means I'm being used up in the reaction faster than I can be replaced. So we start to see those two things kind of tipping um, back and forth, uh, and the balance between them is struck by measuring the molarity of each substance in the reaction. Molarity, we don't use the M necessarily all the time, at least not immediately, so sort of the shorthand way of showing that you're talking about the molarity of something is to put square back brackets around it. So here you see square brackets around NaCl. So that would be the short way of measure, representing the molarity of a substance. Whatever's inside that box is being measured as molarity. So the molarity of NaCl in solution, perhaps, would be shown as square brackets NaCl. Now, to figure out uh, who's winning here, is the forward reaction winning or the reverse reaction winning, what we'll do is calculate a ratio. And we'll actually just compare, then, the, the concentrations of the products to the concentrations of the reactants. And we do that by dividing. If the products are winning, and there's lots and lots and lots of products, then the products number will be very big, and our ratio will be two. If the products are very, very small, are approaching zero, uh, and there's lots and lots of reactants left over, then as you divide this out, you're gonna get a very small K value. And I'll take you through some examples. Now, to show you the equation for calculating uh, the, the, uh, uh, the reaction's sort of favored side, We'll call you. I'll give, give you a name for that here in a moment. Uh, but to, to do that, we need to look back at that equation that we saw at the beginning of the notes today, and that's this A plus B yields C plus D reaction. To to talk about it and up close, actually get into the math of it, we need to balance the equation. To talk about it and get up close to the math, we need to balance this equation. Now we don't know what A and B and C and D are, so we're going to assume that each of them would have a coefficient. Maybe some of them are the same. They could all be ones. We don't really know. But to show that we're talking about the coefficient, uh, we use the same letter, but in lower case. So we balance this equation, this generic equation out, by putting a generic number in front of each substance. A moles of A plus B moles of B yield C moles of C plus D moles of D. And it feels kind of weird to say like that, but that's kind of what those letters represent. Now, to set up the equation, we're going to use this. Now, this equation looks really big, looks difficult. Don't let it, don't let it frighten you. It sounds bad as you might think, and actually pretty straightforward in the examples that I'll show you. But what we're calculating here is called KEQ. Uh, last unit, we had the uh, boiling point elevation constant, or the freezing point depression constant. Here we have the equilibrium constant. So again, it's a number that doesn't change over time, and that we can use... Uh, to compare how C and D are changing, how A and B are changing, or we can go in the lab and calculate KEQ from data that we'll gather ourselves. So the equilibrium constant is set up here. It's the products C and D divided by the reactants A and B. Remember that we compare products to reactants. The products go on the top because they're what we're after, and the reactants are what goes in the bottom and hopefully isn't very much of that left over. But to show the equation mathematically, and we'll see this later on in examples, as to why we need the powers of C, D, A, and B, the little exponential powers. In the end, we compare that ratio of C and D, A and B. But if those coefficients aren't just ones, then we have to take that into account. And if the C, the, low, the small red C in my equation, is a 3, then it becomes a cubed concentration in the math equation. If D had been, for example, a 2, a little lowercase d, then down here we would have the concentration of D squared okay, times 2, or to rather, rather squared, times itself. So whatever the coefficient is up here, a little, little red letters in these examples, whatever those coefficients are, those become my powers in the next, in, in the equation built from that, from that uh, balanced chemical reaction equation. And we'll go through some examples and I'll show you uh, how, how to take numbers and put them in and how to get numbers to work out the problem that you might need to solve. When we calculate KEQ, the only things that we use molarity on are the things that can truly have a changing solution with time. 
a change in concentration rather with time. Solutions, their molarity is easy to find. We've been talking about that for quite a while. And gases, because gases can compress and expand, and when they do that, their concentration changes quite quickly. That's just without adding anything new to the system. So as gases expand and contract, uh, they're going to change their concentration in terms of the moles uh, per liter of, of the gas. So we do use solutions and we do use gases, but we ignore solids, we ignore crystalline solids, we ignore liquids. We don't use those things as far as making this calculation. We're looking to ignore the solids and liquids, uh, any variation of those, because in, in a sense they don't quite change in the typical way. Uh, when a solid or a liquid is used in a reaction, uh, it doesn't get used up in terms of its molarity changing. It doesn't get weaker and weaker. It just gets used up as a solid in a slightly different way. So we leave solids and liquids out when we're calculating KQ. And if you see a solid in the examples uh, or any practice questions, then you want to make sure to not even include them. Once you've got the equation balanced, you can leave the solids and liquids out. And in the end, when we calculate KQ, as you'll see in the examples, when you calculate KQ, anytime KQ comes out greater than 1, it means that the products are greater than the reactants, or the product concentrations are greater than the reactant concentrations. Why does this say this is good? Well, this is good because we want um, products to be made in a reaction because they're probably what we're trying to sell, or we're going to use our product in the next stage of our process and make something that we're going to sell. So if I run a company, I want you to make lots and lots of product. And when KEQ is high, which is to say greater than 1, um, that means the product numbers on the top are bigger and my reactant numbers on the bottom are smaller. And that means I have more product and that means more money for me if I'm a business owner, for example. If KEQ is really small, that means that the reactant numbers are bigger. In other words, how much product divided by how much reactant. This is a smaller number and the reactants are a big, big number. And that's how we get little KEQ values. When it says less than 1 here, it means between 0 and 1. So 0 0.000005 would be a very low KEQ value that's less than 1. And we can make that calculation um, from there. The KEQ calculation then can give you a KEQ that's greater than 1, which is thumbs up and happy. We want lots of products, so that's a good story. Or KEQ less than 1, where the reactant uh, is still in great abundance and we haven't been able to use it very much of it. That's not as good because you want the reactants to be used up um, in the reaction and if you can't get them to go that way the KQ will stay very very small. We're going to go through examples uh, on a different sheet in the next video so for now that'll do for this one and as I've been telling you if you've been taking a lot of notes on topics that haven't been practicing things very much because there hasn't been much to practice and they're kind of starting to feel a little bit like this unit never ends with the notes We'll be getting into practice problems here very soon, and you can try those out as we move on into the next video and the next several. Talk to you then.